And with that out of the way, let me bring Adam in. Adam, hello. How are you? Martin, good to see you. <laughs> Indeed you. And uh, we did a show on your channel a couple of months ago and uh, the um, crypto momentum was beginning to gain ground and it's gained a little bit more ground now. So interesting time and important time to have another conversation. I'm very grateful that you keep your momentum up in this space with respect to keeping the conversation going because we can see that fiat is in big trouble as it has been but that trouble is accelerating very quickly but on the other side of that we've got the big boys as BlackRock are now ramping up to put in their ETF or a spot backed ETF approval through the SEC as are many other companies such as ARK, Valkyrie uh, and many more they're all lining up to have their spot back ETFs approved. But we can see these happening in other countries already. So we've got some countries adopting Bitcoin. We've got other countries investing in ETS. We've got the center of gravity of the United States looking at it. Meanwhile, we've got court cases against certain exchanges and certain individuals. There is never a dull moment in crypto and it is just ramping up. <laughs> it's just pretty amazing, isn't it? And, um, you know, it's worth reflecting, I guess, on the um, on the momentum in the market. We'll just put this slide up, which sort of shows you the um, trajectory of, of Bitcoin over the longer term, right? And we're at sort of knocking around 36, 37, 38 at the moment. So we had that significant run up through the, um, the second half of uh, 23. And um, interestingly, of course, it's still below its um, long term peak. And I guess um, one of the interesting questions uh, which uh, we might want to discuss a little bit is, you know, what is it that's driving this uh, this momentum? You mentioned the ETFs. And of course, a lot of the uh, discussion in the media has been that it's actually the ETF and the pros prospect of major financial players coming in and offering spot ETFs, particularly in the US, that's really explaining the lift. There is also a halving, of course, down the track. So what's, what's your take on what's really driving it? Okay, so we, we've got the Bitcoin halving, which is 143 days away. So that's where the, the supply of Bitcoin will doesn't change, but the amount of Bitcoin that is released into the ecosystem every 10 minutes, every block, that changes. So it started off as 50 Bitcoins every block reward every 10 minutes, then it dropped to 25, then down to 12.25, which is where we are at the moment, and then it's going to drop to 6.25 blocks of Bitcoin per block. So essentially that means that there's going to be not less Bitcoin in the total supply, but less Bitcoin being mined. So it just creates a more um, scarce resource as more people are adopting it, but less of it is being released into the ecosystem. On the other side, we've also got what's happening in the main financial markets. But before we go into that, we can also see that this is a perfectly natural part of this of the cycle. So even without the spot backed ETF, we should expect to see this run up. And in previous cycles and uh, other iterations where it's been a crypto winter, there's still been a lot of talk about a Bitcoin ETF being approved in the United States. Again, there, there's futures ETFs and there's other ETFs that have been approved in other countries, but the big one this time is spot back. That's where they need to actually buy that Bitcoin itself and it will be in the United States. So that's like a massive run up on this. So it's actually two parts where we can see the financial systems are, are really uh, officially getting into this through adopting these ETFs and beyond the ETFs, it will allow a lot of companies to buy their own Bitcoin and just hold it. There'll be a lot more confidence in the ecosystem of all financial markets. But then on the other side, within the crypto land, we also have a lot of development around this space. So many people think this is just a speculative asset and that is certainly a component of it. There is speculation in many assets around the world, but I emphasize this still has a lot of utility. This is a global payment system. It is a potentially a global reserve, a fair, immutable, open, transparent, neutral global reserve that no one can mess with, but everyone could be part of. It's a better financial system that we have than what we have at the moment. And in fact, recently I presented at the Australian Crypto Convention in Melbourne. And during my presentation, I was talking about the world deserving a better global reserve. The global reserve that we have at the moment, of course, being the United States dollar, is backed by in the first instance, we thought it was backed by confidence, but what it's really backed by is the war machine. It's backed by violence. And that might be quite confronting to a lot of people, but the truth is what backs fiat isn't in fact a scarce money linked to gold. It's in fact an unlimited money that's backed by a war machine. So I was talking about in my presentation, Bitcoin being a money of peace, whilst fiat is a money of war. And that may take a while to grasp that concept, but the truth is without war, there's not there's nothing really to back the US dollar beyond confidence. And we can see that the confidence is waning in this money. And the reason why it's waning is because they keep printing it. Inflation is not caused by a war in Russia, as I try and tell you, or because of a flu that came out of 
a certain country, what, it, what inflation is, is the inflation of the money supply. And that money supply, the amount of money that they're printing is beyond control. And this is nothing against the good people of the United States. It's just a fact of money. If they keep printing it and printing it and printing it, we are going to continue to endure this inflation. And no matter how much they put up the interest rates, we can see that it's not bringing prices down. It's just taking money out of the economy and making it much harder for a lot of people. Fuel is more expensive, energy is more expensive, food's more expensive. Just living, everything around life is more expensive. And it's not because of a war in a foreign land, it's because the money printer keeps going burr. And what backs that money printer is the war machine. Yeah, and it's just worth just reflecting, you know, there's a couple of different ways to think about inflation, but inflation effectively is a reduction in the value of the spending power that you've got for each dollar you hold, right? And that actually explains why the prices of everything are going up relative to incomes. And of course, we know that uh, around the world, real incomes have been um, degraded si significantly. But there's a lot of um, issues below the waterline here because, of course, we're talking geopolitics, we're talking uh, global economics, we're talking the uh, hegemony of the US dollar, and uh, of course, BRICS and the other players are trying to sort of create alternatives. So um, it's a fascinating um, dynamic. And in the middle of this, you've got the uh, the, the crypto story. And it's interesting, here's a couple of um, recent headlines. This is from um, Bloomberg the other day, which basically says that the Bitcoin ETF optimism has spurred the latest as the largest asset inflows since late 2021. And uh, that's quite interesting if you then um, uh, have a bit of a look at uh, what the inflows were, because the inflows have been quite significant in recent times. You can see here the uh, weekly crypto asset flows by asset uh, from coin shares. And so there is, there's more money flowing into the, into the crypto universe. And yet on, yet, on the other hand, we've got um, this one, which is basically saying Bitcoin's worst kept secret is about to have a huge price impact. And that um, whilst there's been a huge resurgence in recent weeks, barreling back into Bitcoin bull price, despite market fears that the US could be about to kill it. So there's a real mismatch of, um, of, of sentiment and, and, in fact, you know, articles on this very issue. And I guess it's a matter of showing the uncertainty around all of this and the different p perspectives and points of view. And, and some people would say, Adam, potentially that the SEC's position is almost trying to impose a regulatory framework and the big players into an unregulated crypto universe. Um, what's your perspective on this, you know, on what they're tr trying to do? And do you think regulation is coming? Is it is it going to actually change the game or is it um, a, a side party? So it's quite a deep question because, of course, regulation is an interesting word because what is regulation? It's applying rules to some type of space. But the issue with fiat is that there's different rules for different people. For example, if I were to print money, I would go to jail. But if, fed if a Federal Reserve or equivalent or a bank prints money, they get paid for it. If my business goes bust, I, I'm bankrupt. But if a bank goes bust, they get bailed out or bailed in. So essentially, when it comes to understanding Bitcoin, what it does is it actually changes the architecture of money. It changes the foundations of money and how everything on top of that is built. And no matter what people come in and try and put their rules and their regulations on Bitcoin. So there's two parts to it. There's Bitcoin and there's crypto. But when they try to impose their rules on top of Bitcoin, they can't change the, the foundation or the architecture of the financial system that Bitcoin is. And that's very alarming to them because they can't just print this stuff. Moreover, they can't weaponize it as they, we've seen what they've done with the SWIFT network or the petrodollar, where they just block and stop and seize assets through their SWIFT networks or through the banks. So this changes the rules of money, but it doesn't change the rules of money for the worst. It changes it for the better. Now, of course, it changes it not for the better for those who got to print money in the past and control money and do whatever they wanted with money at the cost of everyone else. Bitcoin levels the playing field. It makes it level for everyone. And that's why it's a money of peace and actually the foundation of democracy. Because we're in this crony capitalistic society at the moment where someone at the top can print money, someone at the top can get bailed out when their business fails. But all of us at the bottom, we have to just deal with this mess. As you mentioned with inflation, it's not that prices are inflating, it's that the money supply is inflating. And as a result, when the money supply inflates, the purchasing power goes down. It's really about that purchasing power. It's not that prices are getting more expensive. Yes, the number's going up, but it's that the dollar or our purchasing power of what we hold is decreasing. 
So Bitcoin changes all of that. It says, look, this is a hard, sound, immutable, fair money available to everyone. And at first they ignored us, then they laughed at us, then they fought us, and now they're trying to join us. And when it comes to the joining part, it's like, okay, this thing's too big now. It's moving too fast. There's too many countries involved. We found that we can't stop it. China couldn't stop it. The miners couldn't break through it with a 51% hack. It just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And as a result, the mainstream's like, well, maybe now we should get on it. But instead of getting on it in a fair manner, in my perception and in the perception of many in the crypto community, they want to impose old, broken, corrupt rules on a new, fair, open system. And that's where you're going to have this cr crash the, or this clash of these two different worlds where we're saying this is a fair, open money to everyone. And they're saying, well, hang on, we better get on top of that and control it the way we've controlled it before, which essentially we can see crashes economies, makes a massive wage gap, promotes war, and essentially is not fair to everyone except for those right at the very top who get the maximum benefit at the cost to everyone else at the bottom. So the United States is understandably doing and now looking at this and saying, well, how do we maintain our position as a global reserve currency? And I don't blame them for that. If you're the global reserve currency, you have the biggest military in the world, not because you have the most people in the world, not because you have the most resources in the world, but because you have the most money in the world. If that suddenly changes, you naturally have to take steps to say, well, hang on a second, how do we ensure we maintain the ability to print the global reserve? But it's too late. It's all over. Because you can see in the past, when countries wanted to pull away from the global reserve, they would come, down, come under military pressure. But they can't apply that military pressure now to China, Russia, Brazil, Iran, uh, Syria, South Africa, all these other countries that are joining Saudi Arabia. They're all joining now the, the BRICS movement. And whether BRICS comes ahead and moves ahead and becomes a currency in itself, that's for a different discussion. The main point I'm trying to make here is that people are losing confidence in the US dollar. And the only way they can buy this themselves out of this is by printing more money. But of course, when they print more money, it just inflates the money supply and it just speeds up the mess that we're going through at the moment. So all fiat always fails. We now have an alternative. Some people don't like Bitcoin, and I understand why they don't like Bitcoin to the extent that I, I think they don't understand what money is. Most people, when they come to me and they say, hey, Adam, what's this Bitcoin thing? I, the, I always answer with the same question being, what's money? And most people think there's this magical, mythical cave somewhere that's full of gold. <laughs> and all of this gold is linked to the money that's coming out into the economy. Well, of course, you and I both know that is a complete fallacy. The money is just printed out of thin air. And the only way governments can create money is by printing it or taking it off their citizens. Now, they take it off their citizens by, of course, taxing us, and we can see that money being taken out of our wages. But what most people can't see, or they're starting to see it, is when they print money, they're actually stealing money from our savings accounts. They're stealing money by diluting or taking our liquid purchasing power out of our savings accounts and putting it into their hands by simply printing away everything that we've worked for. So Bitcoin comes in now and say, well, hang on, we've got a solution here. And many people will say, well, I don't like Bitcoin because it's a scam and terrorism and all of this. But the reality is fiat is the scam. And the money of choice by terrorists isn't Bitcoin. It's the United States dollar. Again, this isn't anything against the United States dollar. But we can see when massive amounts of crime are committed around the world, it's not done by Bitcoin. You can track it. You don't want to have fingers on keyboards because then you can actually track where this money went. What you actually want to use is the US dollar. So now the United States is in a very difficult position because they're going to say, well, how do we maintain the ability to be the global reserve currency? How do we produce real value to essentially run our war machine and run our economy without simply printing it. I'll, I'll give a quick example, if I may, as well. We, we can see there's a lot of conflict around the war, around, around the world, and these wars are costing a lot of money. And I challenge everyone to do the thought experiment. Do you really think the United States or any country would be supporting these wars around the world if every day they had to go into, we'll pick on America here because they're the global reserve currency, if every day the United States government had to go into Fort Knox and take out 1,000 blocks of gold and send them to Ukraine every single day, 1,000 blocks of gold, probably more, 10,000 blocks of gold, and then 10,000 blocks of gold to wherever there was a war, do you really think they'd back those wars that much? Because once that gold is gone, they can't get it back, it's gone. But when it comes to just printing money to fund the war machine, that changes the behavior. 
We might even look at lockdowns. In Australia, as an example, if, if Australia had a big, let's say as an example, a, a little Fort Knox of our own, would that behaviour of Australia be the same, of locking down a nation for, in some instances, nearly up to two years, depending on what state you're in, would that have been the same reaction if we said to these governments, you have to take your gold out of your vaults to lock down the country? Now, this isn't about the pandemic. It's about the actions of governments when they have unlimited money. And when they have unlimited money that they can print and essentially take from their people beyond tax, it changes the behaviours of government. When you actually have to tap into your scarce resources, in this example, blocks of gold in your own vault, things change. The way you act as a government, left or right, it doesn't matter which side of politics you're on, those actions will change because the money is harder and scarcer and fairer. It is interesting if you think about that dynamic, right, in the context of the US, because whilst the um, central bank, the Federal Reserve in the US, has actually um, re reduced their total balance sheet a little bit and, you know, are buying back. The Treasury is actually putting a lot more Treasuries into the market. And in fact, I think they've raised five billion in recent times, right? And there's, you know, a huge number down the track. So in fact, the, the, the total debt pool that actually the US is sitting on at the moment is expanding rather than contracting, which, by the way, might also be inflationary, just another a little, um, a little, a little flag there. So there is I, a... I have that number right now, if, in case you're wondering. Yeah. It's 33.8 trillion US dollars and rapidly climbing. And that's only... Some argue that that 33.8 trillion US dollars is only what they are admitting to. <laughs> There's an argument that it could be well above $100 trillion. That's unforeseeable amounts of money. And if you look at the US debt clock, that's usdebtclock.org, it's like a, a stopwatch that's just ticking away and the numbers are just out of control. In fact, just on the interest payments on their debt, just the interest payments is about the equivalent of what it costs to run their military every year. So the, the truth is there is no plan to get out of this debt. The irony of all of this is that when they meet to say, right, what are we going to do about the debt crisis? They don't talk about paying down the debt. They talk about increasing the debt. Imagine you and I had a credit card and it's like it gets to a point where it's like, okay, I've got 5,000 on the credit card, 10,000 on the credit card, 100,000 on the credit card. And the banks and your family are looking at you and it's like, right, I should probably pay down this debt because the interest is getting out of control. Well, we look at ways on the micro of how do we pay down this debt? But what the US does is they say, no, how do we increase the debt? How do we get more debt? to play this game even further. And how long can we do this for? Well, there is no plan to pay off this debt. So no matter what they do with treasuries and bonds and printing machines and interest rates, the debt just keeps getting bigger. Yeah, it does, absolutely. And of course, other countries around the world are in a similar boat and uh, with interest rates much higher than they were expecting them to be. The supporting costs of that debt on an ongoing basis means that less and less is available to do other things, as you say. You know, you look at the uh, amount of money that governments want to spend and they have to spend more on supporting the debt. So this is an unsustainable situation that um, uh, Western economies in particular have got themselves into. And um, there is really no appetite, in my view, to solving that debt problem. They sort of, they extend and pretend and they muddle around the edge and, you know, do this and that. And interestingly, of course, one of the reasons why taxes are so high relative to uh, where they've been historically is because the only solution is to try and grab more of households and businesses um, money to be able to support the uh, debt burden that they've actually got. So that's one of the reasons why um, taxes will continue to rise rather than fall. And uh, the burden more and more is falling on ordinary um, households and ordinary businesses because, of course, the big the big end of town can uh, mess their um, um, taxing and accounting um, for strategies to alleviate tax dramatically. But of course, ordinary people can't do that. So that's where, and it's interesting that in the UK, they just announced last week, a very small cut in one area of taxation. But overall, the total tax take against individuals has never been higher. So we are in this sort of unsustainable world. And I do think it and is it worth, sorry, it is worth just say, it is worth just reflecting on the fact that it's not like Bitcoin is, you know, over there, completely unstable, whereas what we've got is completely stable and completely mutable. And, you know, the fact is what we've currently got is severely broken, right? <laughs> and that's that's worth just coming back to. The financial system that we are currently part of and living in is actually destroying itself. 
the US dollar, as a matter of fact, is constantly going down. What, what's so interesting is they say the, the dollar, any dollar, is stable. Well, it's not stable. It constantly goes down. That is, that is a matter of fact. Governments will admit it. They, they claim it's going down 2 to 5% per annum, this natural rate of inflation. But, of, of course, it's going down, as we can see in recent times, if you look at the hard data, 10 to 20%. On the other hand, Bitcoin is constantly going up. Yes, it goes back and forth, but on that chart that you showed before, if you could actually click on a, I don't know if you've got the ability to do this live, but click on a log chart of that. So the chart you showed before of Bitcoin was trying to capture a Bitcoin at $0 and a Bitcoin at 69,000 US dollars. And it's very difficult for a chart to capture that. So if you go to a log chart, you can actually see it's pretty much consistently up and to the right. And sure, it has years that it pulls back, but as an aggregate, Bitcoin is constantly going up. Equally, as an aggregate, the US dollar and all dollars are constantly going down. The only difference is, is that it's happening slower with the dollars over time, but it's actually starting to speed up. So over a long time, it was like 2 to 5%, but now it's going to 5 to 10% and 10 to 20%. So it's like the ship was sinking. I mean, first it was just a few little drizzles coming into the lower decks. But as the ship starts to sink, the ship of fiat starts to sink faster and faster, more and more and more water is coming in and now it's sinking even further. And the lifeboat of Bitcoin is getting more and more attractive. So what's happening is in this example, this metaphoric example, that the rich who are on the upper decks, they're telling everyone below decks, oh no, everything's fine here. There's nothing to worry about. You're okay. But on the upper decks, the rich are getting in their helicopters ready to flee to the lifeboat of Bitcoin. And that's what you can see with BlackRock and their ETFs. But of course, at the same time, you've got the US in the middle saying, well, hang on, how do we maintain this ship of fiat that's sinking very fast when all the rich people and all the powerful people are fleeing to the lifeboat of Bitcoin? And the, another reason why Bitcoin is going up is it because what it's compared to, and you and I have discussed this at length on many times and many <laughs> interviews, is that what's the anchor point? And another way to prove that Bitcoin is going up is to, to look, compare it to gold. Instead of comparing it to the US dollar, it's naturally going to go up against the US dollar because the US dollar is constantly going down, as is the Australian dollar. It's constantly going down in purchasing power. But if you actually chart Bitcoin to gold, an ounce of gold has pretty much bought the same amount of stuff every <clears throat> over time. And a good example I heard with an ounce of gold is an ounce of gold can buy a tailored-made men's suit now, just as it could a hundred years ago. And I thought that was a pretty interesting anchor point. But if you look at what, how much Bitcoin got, it can buy of gold, Bitcoin can buy way more gold now than what it could before. So if you want to use fiat as the anchor point, Bitcoin is going up. If you want to use gold as the anchor point, Bitcoin is going up. But if you want to invert that and say, how much purchasing power has any dollar got, it's constantly going down. And it's just so ironic that people will say, well, I'd rather keep all my money in this thing that's constantly going down because at least I, I know it's going down at a certain rate. But where that is changing, Martin, is that when it comes to US treasuries and bonds, the global market is saying, you know what, I'm not interested in that anymore because I'm not getting a good deal here. If you want to give me a five, even a 5% return on a US treasury or bond, the inflation rate is much higher than that. So what you're saying is when you buy these bonds or these treasuries, you're saying, I'm willing to take a 2% cut every year at least. Now, so, and when we saw this with negative yielding bonds with Germany, people were still buying it because they thought, well, at least negative 2% is better than negative 7%. But it's now getting to the point that there is an alternative. Where do you put your money? And many of these companies and countries and institutions and individuals are saying, well, I don't want it in the dollar because that's going down. I don't want the bonds and treasuries because they're still going down. I don't want to put it in the bank because, well, they could block it, seize it, bail in, bail out laws. They can do what they want with it and the money's going down. So where do I put my money? Gold is heavy and slow and you've got to store it and it's difficult to move and it's not very fungible. And now there's an alternative where you have Bitcoin and say, you know what? It's open, immutable, transparent. I know there's only 21 million. It may work or it may not work, but I'm going to hedge my bets because at least I know for a fact that the dollar's not working. I can't guarantee Bitcoin will work, but it's looking much better than what the US dollar is because they keep printing that crap while that one has a fixed supply. Yeah, and let me just come back to the log chart. I did actually do the log. Now, why is, why is the log telling you something that the linear isn't telling you? I don't understand just changing the scale, why that changes the argument. Okay, so if you look at the vertical axis on the left, 
what actually happens is it changes the increments typically by 10 hmm. on, on, on the left there. So what, what it's capturing there is instead of trying to capture a coin that is one cent and then $69,000, all it does is it compresses the vertical axis on the left. It changes the scale of the vertical axis. Now, the reason why in traditional markets we don't use a log scale much is because we don't see these violent movements that happen in, in crypto. It's it's not uncommon for a crypto to go from one ten thousandth of a cent, and that might be a difficult word to say, but we do this in crypto, to go from one ten thousandth of a cent to two dollars. And if you have a linear chart, it's very difficult to capture that. But when you have a log chart, you can actually change that access axis so you can actually get we say i call it the noise that when you had that chart up before the the chart was too noisy so we we remove some of that noise by reducing the the differences on the vertical um, axis you'll you'll get used to doing this a lot more in crypto we do this a lot more in crypto because of these violent moves but what you can see martin what the even with the log chart you can see that in the first part from 2017 to 2018 it's really volatile. It goes straight up. But over time, what you can see, even in this axis, even in this uh, view, that it's becoming less volatile. And this, we expected this. We expected this. When you've got a market cap of a million dollars, you only need a million dollars to double that market cap. And that creates a big movement. But once market caps start get, get, getting over a trillion dollars, which Bitcoin just check it, is at the moment, I'll just double check my work here. Um, at one stage, Bitcoin was well over a trillion dollars. The entire market cap of all crypto at the moment is $1.4 trillion. And we'll we'll see as Bitcoin goes up, that market cap gets bigger, the volatility reduces. So lower cap market coins, they they um are very volatile because a very low market cap is easy to move. But the analogy, if you recall, I gave you an analogy years ago. I said, when if you're in an ocean, as an example, and you have these volumes of money coming through. So you have a little sailing boat, which is Bitcoin, a little tiny fishing boat, and a big three meter wave hits this fishing boat. And this fishing boat goes all the way up and all the way down. That's because the fishing boat is small and it's very much affected by these waves of metaphoric money in this example. Then you put a big oil tanker on that same ocean facing that same wave. The size of that tanker is so big that even when the same three meter wave hits it or three meter amount of water uh, money in this example, it barely moves the boat at all. And that's what you see in traditional markets. You, the gold market, as an example, when you're looking at the, on the news, they say gold moved 10 points today, which is like you know, a tenth of a percent. Mm. But that same amount of money in Bitcoin would move Bitcoin many percent. And that volatility as the little fishing boat in this example gets bigger and bigger and grows up to be a tanker on those same oceans of the same volume of money, it moves the markets less. And that log chart it demonstrates that perfectly. It shows the bigger that Bitcoin gets, the less volatile it becomes. But the main point I want everyone to grasp from that graph is that it's constantly up and to the right. Now, if you bring up the US dollar purchasing power, it's constantly down and to the right. So the main point here is that Bitcoin is constantly going up in purchasing power, whilst the US dollar and all fiat are constantly going down. Well, interesting observation. I have to say that not everyone's convinced that log um, scale graphs tell you anything different than linear ones, but uh, it was inter very interesting to see some of the comments in the chat. But They um, absolutely do. They, yeah, they, I, yeah. I, I saw those comments, but, but they absolutely do. They get rid mm. of the noise. I, again, I emphasize it's, it's so difficult to grasp a chart to get something that's worth half a cent to $69,000, mm. down to $500, down to $30,000. Now, let's um, move the conversation forward because, of course, the concept of exchanges on which you buy and sell cryptos, convert um, fiat currencies to crypto or, or, or whatever, have definitely been in the news for all the, the wrong reasons. And of course, we had the um, the SBF problem with the collapse of FTX last year, and of course, criminal charges and what have you going on there. And we also had um, quite a few uh, observations from people um, saying that, um, you know, this is um, the downfall of FTX is undoubtedly going to shape the future, leading to tighter regulation and a renewed focus on uh, regulation of all sorts and sizes. So, you know, that's clearly a part of the story. And then, of course, we had the, uh, the, the Binance chief who resigns. <laughs> that's the second biggest exchange as crypto exchange pays $4 billion in fines. So basically, my take out of this 
is that the two biggest exchanges have actually both essentially been accused of criminal activity at the very least. So the question is, can we trust exchanges? And if we can't trust exchanges, what does that tell you about the whole Bitcoin story? Again, the architecture of Bitcoin is rock solid. It's not a Bitcoin is not an exchange. Bitcoin is an exchange is somewhere where you can just buy Bitcoin. Let's start with FTX. FTX was the biggest financial crime in history. It was the biggest crime by the number of people that were affected, and it was the biggest crime with the amount of money that was lost. We rejoice in the crypto sector that scam bankrupt, <laughs> scam bankrupt fraud, as we call them, Sam Bankman Freed was arrested and is currently behind bars because he committed a horrific crime, but it was a financial crime, not a crypto crime. Now, what do I mean by that? The tactics that he used to rip off a lot of people and commit that crime wasn't so much that he broke Bitcoin or he broke the code. He just made an exchange and co-mingled funds and was found guilty on seven charges, which is a, a whole video in itself. He will, if, if there is justice and everything is fair, now noting his parents are very well connected, he should face up to 140 years in prison. He should, by right, spend the rest of his life behind bars. That's because he committed financial crimes. Now, the truth is, if you had used FTX and you bought Bitcoin or any coin through FTX and you took it off that exchange and put it in your wallets, that wouldn't have affected you. Because an exchange is somewhere where you literally, as the word says, you exchange one thing for another thing. It might be dollars, it might be stable coins, it might be Bitcoin. You go into that exchange and you swap what you have for what they offer or what they have available. Where people went wrong is that they, they left their money on that exchange. And then Sam Bankman Freed took that money that was left on the exchange and used it for really bad things, ultimately leading to the collapse of that exchange. What he did was criminal and he should be held to account for it. Binance is a different situation. So if you think about what happened with CZ, Binance is the biggest exchange in the world by, by a long way. CZ is not an American citizen. So there's two parts to this. If you look at what the mainstream's saying, it's like, well, CZ is bad. He was doing criminal stuff. We needed to stop him. If you dig a little deeper, you see that he very quickly got a $4 billion fine he, it doesn't look like he's facing any prison time. It all happened very quickly. And the, the market price or the um, coin price of Bitcoin, uh, sorry, of Binance, my apologies, is now $10 higher than what it was 30 days ago. So FTT, the, co the coin to FTX, that collapsed very quickly because it was a, a complete scam and the whole thing fell to pieces. But people who used FTX and bought Bitcoin and took it off, they still hold their Bitcoin. Where it went wrong is where people left their money on the FTX platform and the native token to FTX, FTT, collapsed with it. When you go over to Binance, the accusation was to Binance was that, hang on, you, essentially you didn't get enough KYC on everyone who was using this. And we suspect that there was people who were using Binance that were doing bad stuff. And I say, you know what, you're probably right. There's a lot of people who use the US dollar for bad stuff. It might, if you take all the US dollars in the world and you do tests on it, you can see a lot of them are laced with cocaine. You can see that a lot of crime is done with the US dollar. So it's not so much that in that instance that the American government is doing something illegal because people use the US dollar for illegal things. But I acknowledge absolutely, there are probably people who used Binance to move money from point A to point B whilst avoiding certain jurisdictions where governments at the time couldn't see it. Now, Binance has adapted to this very quickly and they've, they've got KYC, know your customer, which is essentially information on the customer, like show us your ID, show us where you live, show us proof of residence. So governments can come over and track all of this money. So what's very different of Binance converse, uh, compared to FTX is FTX pretty much collapsed overnight and the founder is in jail and will be facing up to 140 years behind prison. When we go to Binance, it was very different because it was like a, a quick find, a slap on the wrist, step down from being in charge and replace your CEO. Where we get into a bit of a conspiracy theory, and I put this out here, is that many of us believe that it was BlackRock clearing the way for them to, to hold that dominant position because BlackRock has more money than most countries in the world. And when BlackRock came in and got the ET, or perhaps will get the ETF approved, they want to be the center of gravity, understandably, 
for all the transactions of all of this exchange that's going to be happening in the crypto space. Binance made so much money, not just from their native token, but from the fees. The amount of trading volume that happens on these exchanges is phenomenal. Remember, it doesn't just go nine to five, five days a week. It goes 24-7, 365, anywhere in the world with an internet connection. The sheer volume of transactions that go th that went through Binance and still go through Binance is awe-inspiring compared to something like the NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange. So now that the big boys are coming into this space and we argue that, well, they're trying to Wall Street eyes, if you will, crypto, there's an argument, and I think it's a very valid argument, that... BlackRock ordered this. They said, right, Binance has been operating for years. They've got complete market dominance. We need you to clear the way so we can come in and take that position. But Binance is still so strong that even after everything that's happened, the price of their coin went up. The, the um, platform still operates. And sure, they've lost some of their market share, but they're still number one. They're still the biggest exchange in the world by a long shot. So it actually just goes to show that this exchange is very robust. Now, it's been attacked in the United States, but it's certainly under looking very strong to be the central exchange for Asia and potentially the Middle East as well, where there's going to be huge amounts of volume of trade coming through this, primarily in Hong Kong and China, where a lot of these big nations are getting into this. Then you go into the Middle East, where CZ, the founder of Binance at the moment, is in the UAE. And you can see that, in fact, perhaps it was too little too late because Binance had too big of a market share and a $4 billion fine. Sure. It sounds like a lot, but Binance is immensely wealthy and that, that fine was pretty much paid straight away. And they paid that fine without selling the token. They didn't have to sell BNB to pay that fine. They literally had enough reserves in their accounts to say, yep, here you go, America, here's your fine. America then replaced the CEO of Binance. Some argue, and I can't substantiate this, that the new CEO has ties with the WEF. And now you've got a the biggest exchange in the world that's got an inside man, and I can't substantiate this, working with the World Economic Forum. Um, and America has now cleared the way a little bit for the BlackRock ETF to be approved. And if BlackRock gets even half of the transactions, just the transaction fees, don't worry about owning Bitcoin, don't worry about native tokens, don't worry about pump and dumps. If BlackRock owns even or gets just half of the trading volume fees that Binance got, they stand to make billions upon billions of dollars very quickly. And I think the most uh, interesting comment that you made right at the front there was understand an exchange is the ability to translate one entity or one currency into another currency, but you shouldn't necessarily hold those coins on an exchange. It is not the same as a bank, is it? This is a really, really important point. A lot of people don't get. They sort of assume that the regulatory framework that protects the banking system and, and, and money in the banks to an extent, although you and I believe that it's probably not so well protected as many people think, but an exchange is not the same as that. It's actually much more unregulated. So what you need to do is to shift those coins from the exchange once you've actually converted them. That's right. So some people treat exchanges as a bank, like they, they put a deposit in the bank and they leave it there. But imagine you went to the bank and you say, right, I'm going to, it gets weird because now we think about gold. It's kind of the reverse of gold. In the olden days, you take gold to a bank because you didn't want to carry this big heavy thing around, but you wanted to maintain that, vol that power of gold, the purchasing power of gold. So you'd go to the bank and you say, hey, bank, you look after my gold and give me a banknote. And of course, then we went around with banknotes because they were, they were fungible, they were easy to move, they were lightweight, and they were always accepted. But of course, we can see over history, what happened is the goldsmith or the bank, they realized that was no, no one was coming back to the bank to cash in their banknotes for the gold, so they kept all the gold. Crypto exchanges are kind of the, the opposite. They say, right, I actually want to go to the exchange to buy this digital gold to maintain that purchasing power and avoid inflation. So they go into the bank, this being the exchange, this digital exchange, and they say, here's my fiat, give me some of that digital gold. And the exchange comes through, and FTX did come through. They said, here you go, here's your Bitcoin. But instead of taking it out and keeping it under your mattress figuratively, or in your safe, or somewhere where you control it and you're in control of it, they just said, oh, all right, I'll just leave it on the exchange. And then what happened is you actually had the double spend, if you will, of what we saw with the goldsmiths 
where they were writing two or three notes against the same block of gold that was left in on their in their vaults. But unlike banks, people could actually try and take their money out very quickly just by doing it like an email and just saying, I'm trying to withdraw the money. And when they did try to withdraw the money because there was talk of, hey, it's not there, it was essentially a run on the banks. That's essentially what happened with FTX. They were spending money like banks do, that is spending money that they didn't have. They were spending money as in a double spend on money per se. And when everyone came in and said, give me my money back, it was a run on the bank and the whole thing collapsed. But the irony is banks are doing this right now. And this is no secret. If we all went to the bank right now, and this isn't a conspiracy theory at all, you know it, I know it, governments know it, banks know it. If we all went to the bank right now and said, give us our money, the banks would collapse. And you can see that in other countries when they try to do this, when they, like, I think Lebanon was the latest one, when they tried to do a run on the banks, the banks actually shut down the banks and said, no, you can't take your money. And there's that one example, and there's many like it, but the one that sticks out in my mind the most is a son needs to save, save his father by buying a, a kidney transplant or paying for a medical procedure. Now, this son had the money in the bank. It was his money in the bank. And the bank, everyone was doing a run on the banks, but he needed the money to save his father's life. And he went to the bank and said, hey, I need to take my money out. And the bank said, no, you can't have your money. And he's like, what do you mean I can't have my money? My dad's going to die. It's my money. It's there. I'm not asking for a loan. It's my money in your bank. And the argument, the answer essentially was, we don't have your money. There is no money. So that man ended up holding up a bank and robbed the bank, not to steal their money, but to steal his own money. And he, eventually the bank gave him his money and he went and saved his father. And now he's in jail for robbing a bank to get his own money that the bank wouldn't give him. So it gets very complex, but ultimately it goes right back to what I said at the beginning. You cannot change the architecture or foundations of Bitcoin. If you get that Bitcoin and you hold it, the banks can't seize it. The governments can't seize it. The governments can't print more of it. They can't block it. They can't seize it. They can't do anything with it. You have control of this money. So when it comes to an exchange, you we treat them like public toilets. You get in there, you do your business, and you get out. That's it. <laughs> Where it went wrong is people don't understand what money is. They therefore think an exchange is like a bank. But exchanges are not banks. Although you can treat them like banks, exchanges are simply, I'm swapping this for that. Don't leave the money there, get it out. But I, now we go back to Binance. Binance was oper and is operating properly, and they've got more than enough money to cover everything because they're not doing the wrong thing. Anyone who's left their money on, FT, uh, on Binance, they haven't lost their money. The money is there. Here's the irony, Martin. Do you know who would stop the people getting their money out of Binance? Governments, not the exchange, governments. Binance has all the money there. They have huge amounts of profits. They have so much money that they can pay a $4 billion fine at the press of a key and still hold everyone's assets there. So Binance is in fact so big and so reliable and so strong that they're a huge threat to the traditional financial sector because they are better than a bank. They're doing more business than a bank. They're more reliable than a bank. They're in fact more transparent than a bank. They're in fact less corrupt than a bank. But the mainstream will tell you the opposite. It's like, no, 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 they were doing money laundering. Well, we know banks are doing huge amounts of money laundering. We can even see that Commonwealth Bank was part of money laundering. HSBC was part of money laundering. But they're not shut down. They're given a very small slap on the wrist and you crack on as business as usual. So how do we fix all of this? Well, you break down the system of banks altogether and you create a fair, hard, sound, open, immutable money that everyone can be part of. And that is, in fact, Bitcoin. Yeah, interesting comments in the chat as well. Uh, one of them I thought was quite um, insightful. See what you think from Luke S. If everyone sells their crypto at once, crypto crashes too, Adam. So to what extent is um, there a real difference? A huge difference. The verb sell is very different to withdraw. Make, make that distinction. If I go to the bank and say, oh, I want to take my gold out, I'm not selling my gold, I'm taking my gold out. So, of course, anything that you, everyone sells, it'll go to zero. If everyone dumps their US dollar, it will go to zero. If everyone sells their house, it's going to zero. If everyone sells their crypto, it's going to zero. Absolutely no argument. That's an economic fact. Pulling money out of the bank or pulling your coins off an exchange is not selling. That's withdrawing. They are two completely different verbs. Now, um, one of the interesting conversations, of course, is that the digital world that we're talking about is totally reliant on connectivity and power. 
And I guess there's a couple of questions. A couple of people in the chat earlier on asked about the power required to mine Bitcoin, which we'll come back to. But I'm interested in the Optus story, right? Because a couple of weeks ago, we had a major outage across Australia. And, uh, you know, people with phones couldn't connect. People with computers couldn't connect. Banks couldn't take payments. It was a, a complete disaster. So one of the questions I've got for you is, as we move into this um, digital alternative, aren't we becoming more and more reliant on connectivity, power, digital, you know, all of those things? And what happens when the power goes off? Okay, so there, there is a solution. You write a hard money against a hard money. So what do I mean by that? So you and I absolutely share the values of moving against the cash ban. So the cash ban says they were going to take cash out of society and everything is going to be yep. digital. So this might seem like a bit of an oxymoron because you've got the crypto guy on here saying, I support cash entirely, but we need to make the distinction of what backs the cash. So the answer is we actually do need the ability to have a physical transaction. And that physical transaction could be transacting gold, which is very slow and heavy and difficult to verify. It could be barter where I'm giving meat for chicken eggs or whatever, or it could be a, a note that is written against something that is hard and scarce. So there is actually a solution. And the solution is that, it, sure, if we're going to have cash, the cash has to be backed by something. And the question is, what backs the cash? Now, we go back to the old model, and the old model was what backed the cash was blocks of gold in a vault somewhere. But as we can see, what happened over time was people, first of all, did a double spend on the gold in the vault by putting three, four, five, six notes against the same bit of gold in the vault. But then... Later on, when America got control of all the gold, and they said, hey, you, you, everyone in the world, you give us the gold, we'll give you these notes. And we promise two things. We promise that you can swap your notes back for the gold any time. And we promise that we won't print more notes than there are, are gold. Now, of course, they broke the, the promise twice. First of all, they printed way more notes than there was gold. And they delinked the gold from the notes anyway. So that was broken. When we go to what we do in the future, digital is here. And digital is a huge part of what we do. I go back again to the foundation of Bitcoin. The architecture of Bitcoin is that there's 21 million, that's it. So how do we write a physical note against Bitcoin or gold or anything? Well, the truth is the technology behind it is in fact digital, where we put a QR code on that note. Now, when the power goes out, the reality is we, we have a period of time that we have to figure out what the hell we're going to do. How are we going to trade with each other? Do we write IOUs? Now, we can see that happened with IGAs and kind of Woolworths in small country towns when there was huge floods and fires and money couldn't get, be taken out of ATMs. How do you do exchanges? Well, do you do IOUs? Do you do bartering? What do you do? If you have a cash, that's fine, but it goes right back to the original question. What backs the cash? If the cash can be printed without limit, then we've got a fiat, we've got inflation, and we're in the mess where we're at at the moment. So then we go to the philosophical question, Martin. Do we always want to live in constant financial ruin with fiat in fear of the two hours that we're at without power? Now, that might sound pretty out there, but it's like, okay, well, we're going to give all the power to the banks. We're going to allow them to print this fake money out of thin air. And it's going to come at the cost of continual inflation, continual wealth divide, continual war, continual corruption, because there might be a day that the power goes out for two hours. As we evolve as a society, we say, well, hang on a second, power is going to go out and there will be times that the internet goes down. But do we want to give up 99% of what we do all day, every day, forever for the sake of a, a, an accident that will happen? I'll, I'll give an ex ex another example. I know how we can solve all road death tolls across the planet. We just stop cars. If, I promise you, if you ban all cars, no one will die in a motor vehicle accident ever again. I also know how we can stop all plane crashes and plane air disasters. We just turn off all planes everywhere and there'll never be another plane crash again ever, I promise. But of course, what I just said sounds totally absurd. It's like, oh, don't be stupid. Why? Of course, you could stop all car accidents by banning all cars, but we don't do that. We mitigate the risk. We put in seatbelts, we put in laws, we have better response times, we have better roads, we have better lights, better tyres, and we put in all these layer two solutions to deal with this situation of what comes with the great freedom of a car 
but some of the consequences of having a car. The same is true with money. There is no perfect money. I, I don't proclaim for a second that Bitcoin is perfect. It can't be perfect because there's no such thing as perfection. It doesn't exist. We cannot get a perfect money just as we can't get a perfect partner. But what we have at the moment is the closest thing to a perfect money. And most certainly, if someone comes up, and I've said it for many years and I'll say it again, if someone can come up with a better Bitcoin, I'm all in because I want a better money. You want a better money. But when it comes to what happens when the power goes out, well, that's something that we could properly and maturely discuss and figure out, yeah, this is something that we have to deal with because the power is going to go out and we have to deal with this. But I don't think the solution is continue down the path of a broken, corrupt fiat system that destroys everyone at the benefit to those right at the very top. And it's certainly true, of course, that the power disrupted ordinary payment systems and ordinary money significantly. And uh, Really good. I, I should have mentioned that, yeah. So yeah, the fee yeah. was destroyed by power as well. Yeah. Correct. So it kind exactly. of, it, it cancels itself out, doesn't it? <laughs> it's, it's both sides of the ledger, it seems to me. And in fact, the, only, right. the only people who were able to um, buy things and, and sell things were people who actually had cash, which is one of the reasons why I still believe that you should have the right and the privilege of carrying cash if you want to. So, you know, I, I, I'm perfectly accepting that more people will probably go digital and will use digital payment systems, et cetera, et cetera. But the backstop has to be access and availability of cash, which is what I continue to campaign for at the moment because and, when, and the lights, support you. Yeah, when the lights go out, when the digital systems go down, cash is the only thing that is there. And by the way, it is a medium of exchange, a source of value, all those things that, that, that you need money to be. And of course, it's also at the moment legislated to be there in, in the system. So um, I will resist with to my last breath the removal of cash without necessarily saying that it doesn't mean you shouldn't have alternatives. All right? And then when it comes to the alternatives question, clearly the existing system that we have from a banking perspective is not particularly effective for all the reasons we've discussed. And also worth just underscoring, when you put money in the bank, when you put deposits in the bank, you're making a loan to the bank. So they are not actually holding your money sort of in a safe somewhere for you to go and get it when you want it. What they're doing is borrowing your money and then using it to lend on, which of course is when a bank run happens, more people want to get the money out than the bank's ability to be able to provide the money is when a bank run happens. So it's worth both reflecting that in the existing system, in the existing system, with the existing money that we've got, there are some risks below the surface that a lot of people don't actually understand. And I, I keep coming back to this idea. When you put your money in a bank, you're lending money to the bank. An unsecured loan, I might add there. So it's yep. an unsecured loan that you're giving to the bank. And also what's happening is when we look at what happened with FTX's example, there was an allegation where it was substantiated that they were co-mingling funds. That is, they were taking the people's deposits and the people's crypto and using it for something else. Well, who does that legally? Banks do that. They co-mingle funds quite legally. They take your deposits or loan and do what they want with it. And then when it all falls to pieces, they go to the government and say, oh, g'day government, sorry. The, the one thing we we're supposed to do was manage money and we've screwed it up, so give us money because we're too big to fail. And the government goes, oh, no problem. We're, we can see that you totally made a mess here, but because you're too big to fail, we're going to bail you out with taxes or bail you in with the people's savings. So banks have to act irresponsibly because their competitors are acting irresponsibly. <laughs> if they take a big risk, they win. But if they take a big risk and it fails, they win through bail-in and bail-outs. But if they take a big risk and it succeeds, they win through taking the massive rewards from a huge risk. So that whole thing is market failure. But I, I will just touch again quickly on cash. Cash is a layer two solution. So remember, you've got a base layer, which used to be gold. And then you wrote a note on top of that. And that solution was gold is heavy and slow, but a banknote is light and fungible. So when it comes to cash, cash is this layer two solution. And it doesn't matter how deep it goes, where you've got the foundation, which is the gold or the Bitcoin. And that's what's rock solid and scarce and hard money. When it comes to the layer two solution on top of that hard money, well, what could we do? And it goes back to, it doesn't have to be one money. There's already multiple monies. There's multiple languages. But the base layer, the layer one solution, whether it's gold or whether it's Bitcoin, that has to be rock solid. But I also emphasize when it comes to gold, 
Gold has, we don't know what the supply of gold is. There's about, I think it's four Olympic sized swimming pools of gold that we've pulled out of the ground. But we don't know that that's all the gold we've got. In fact, we can show that there's about 5% more that's added to that every year. So it's got an inflation rate itself of about 5%. Well, we haven't discovered all the gold reserves in the world. And whilst I can't guarantee you that, we'll, that there's gonna, we're going to triple the gold supply, I can guarantee you that we're not going to triple the Bitcoin supply. So we could come across a big vein of gold in the I don't know, bottom of the Grand Canyon. We get better at exploring underwater, deep underwater ocean mines and veins, and we pull out a lot of gold, and suddenly we've just increased the supply of gold. Well, that may happen or may not happen, but I can guarantee it's not going to happen with Bitcoin. I can equally guarantee that when it comes to dollars and cents, or just dollars, because who cares about cents now, they just keep printing the stuff. So ironically, the most sure, and this is where people say, Bitcoin is a better gold in this instance, because it's a better layer one solution. We know what the supply is. Everyone can see it. It's very auditable. Right now, I can bring up a screen and I can audit from my bedroom how much Bitcoin is floating around the ecosystem. But I can't do that with gold. Even if I was the richest person in the world, even if I was the biggest and richest and most powerful government in the world, I can't audit gold. How do I do it? Do I go to all the Indian women who are the biggest gold holders of gold on the planet and count all of their necklaces? Do I go to every vault in every bank, everywhere, everywhere in the world and count each block of gold and test each block of gold? So when it comes to the auditability of Bitcoin, it's far more secure and far more auditable than gold or any other money out there. But I absolutely agree with you, Martin, and you'll never get an argument from me that we need cash because it's not just about when the power goes down. It's about privacy. Privacy is, uh, is about freedom. We, we should have the freedom of speech, the freedom of association, the freedom of commerce, the freedom to purchase something in private. I'm not talking about bad things, but maybe I want to buy a bottle of wine and I don't want my friend to see it. Maybe I want to buy the Quran in a country that doesn't like a certain religion or the Bible. Maybe I want to donate to a certain political party. These, these privacies are in fact freedom. And anyone who says, well, we don't need financial privacy, I, I give this analogy. It's like, okay, well, why do you need physical privacy? So, you know, we've all got the same body. What have you got to hide? You know, why do you need medical privacy? Why do you need physical privacy? Why does there need to be different bathrooms for different genders? If we're all the same, you know, we've all got the same body. Why do you need any privacy? And it's like, it's because we're not savages. It's because we're human beings and privacy is part of freedom. When you relate that to the financial sector, initially people go, well, if you've got nothing to hide, if you're not doing anything wrong, you've got nothing to hide. Well, why can't I buy a bottle of beer in privacy? Why can't I join a YouTube subs subscription or other naughty subscription without privacy? And the argument is tax and terrorism. And then we go back to, it's like, okay, well, so we've got to take away everyone's privacy because there could be a terrorist amongst us. And it's like, okay, well, I go back now to the car analogy. We should take away everyone's car because someone's going to have a car crash today. So we don't do it with cars. We don't take all the cars away because there could be a car crash today, but we shouldn't take away everyone's privacy because there could be one or two criminals amongst us. What we should do is reinforce the police and investigation agencies to be able to do their job as police. What we shouldn't do is become a communist nation, and this links to a CBDC, where we put a blanket rule over everyone, where big brother government can watch every single thing you do and block, seize and monitor your cash at any time, putting boundaries on your money because one of you might be bad. It's and a bit just, of a rant, wasn't it? No, it's good. No, that's fine. And there's interesting reactions in the chat. Some people um, very much on the um, you know on the privacy line of argument and saying that's important. Um, just going back to the energy thing, um, energy, of course, is used to mine Bitcoin and to store the data. Now, my understanding is that a lot of the miners are actually using um, you know renewable power rather than actually um, fossil fuel power. So what's what's the sort of the current story with regards to the energy usage, usage of Bitcoin? A really good question, and I'll answer it in multiple parts. So there is no doubt whatsoever, so in case anyone's saying I'm hiding it, no. Bitcoin mining uses lots of energy, lots of energy. Fact. I mine, and I can tell you right now, I'm intimately familiar with how much energy Bitcoin mining uses. Okay, that disclaimer and fact aside, now let's dig a little deeper. Tumble dryers use more energy globally than the Bitcoin global financial system. 
and very few people comparative to what could be accessing Bitcoin use tumble dryers. I'm talking about dryers that dry your clothes. That uses way more energy than Bitcoin and no one's talking about that. The gold industry, that's all the mining, all the smeltering, all the ripping up of the planet, that uses way more energy than Bitcoin and no one talks about that. The banking industry, surprise, <laughs> uses unforeseeably more energy than Bitcoin and I wonder why no one's talking about that. But here's the difference, Martin. As you said, a lot of miners are innovating and using renewable energy. So we use the, I use the example of the Commonwealth Bank in the middle of Sydney, a huge building that's in the middle of Sydney that took huge amounts of energy to build. Lots of people drive there every day, burning lots of energy. They go into this building that operates really nine to five, five days a week, if that. That energy is heated and cooled and refitted and refurbed and there's papers and there's people and there's toilets flushing and there's lights going on. Unforeseeable amounts of energy in the middle of Sydney is being burnt for that one bank in that one country. But I can't pick up that bank and say, well, hang on a second. The energy is not very efficient there or renewable there. Even if I cover that entire building in solar panels, it's still not enough to run the thing. That requirement for energy, it's not mobile. Now we go over to a Bitcoin mining farm. A Bitcoin mining farm, which runs the algorithm, which enables the Bitcoin blockchain to work, that is available to everyone, not just in that city, not in that country, but globally, everywhere, everyone with an internet connection can tap into it for free. But that mining rig can be moved to where the power is free. Now, that, that might be confronting to a lot of people. Say, oh, don't be stupid. There's not free power. There is huge amounts of free power in the world. The amount of gas that is flared into the atmosphere just energy gone, just burning into the atmosphere. I can't convert that flared gas energy into the Commonwealth Bank in Sydney, but I can take a mining farm to that, and they are doing it, they have done it, and they capture that energy that was just being released into the atmosphere, and they, they turn generators or turbines, which turn generators, and they use that energy almost for free. Sure, there's infrastructure costs to set it up, but they capture that wasted energy and they redirect it back into the blockchain. Then you go to geothermal springs in the middle of Iceland, as an example, where steam is pouring out of the ground. Again, I can't pick up a bank in Sydney or New York and say, hey, there's a lot of free energy over there. We're going to pick up this banking system and we're going to move you into the middle of Iceland to catch that steam coming out of the ground. Well, they can and do that with Bitcoin mining. Then you go to massive solar panels or solar farms in the middle of the desert. You can only move solar energy so far. Now, solar energy doesn't, isn't that efficient yet, but there are still miners who are trying to innovate solar energy to, in fact, make that energy more efficient and more powerful so they can run their mining farm. So and then you go to hydro. There are huge waterfalls where water is falling over a, a, a cliff and the amount of energy that's just going to waste. Again, I can't move my bank to, to that system to capture that hydroelectric energy, but I can do it with mining farms and the mining farms are doing it everywhere. They are innovating very quickly and moving to capture this free or wasted energy. Nuclear power plants are another example. Or even coal farms or coal mining plants where there's times where there's excess energy. They can capture this excess energy and say to these companies, hey, at three o'clock in the morning when there's not much energy being used, we want to buy that energy off you at a reduced price because you either sell it to us at a reduced price or it just gets wasted into the atmosphere. And the, the companies go, yeah, all right, we'll sell you a third price energy at three o'clock in the morning when no one's using it, but we're not selling you reduced energy at peak time. And the miners go, yeah, no problem. We'll take that free energy when no one else is using it and we won't touch it when everyone else needs it. So the amount of innovation that is coming around this space with respect to the use of energy is absolutely mind boggling and, and inspiring. Now I go to the other end of the chain. Bitcoin saves the environment, not just from what I described of using less energy than tumble dryers or the gold industry or banks. It saves money because it reduces consumption. So at the peak of the last bull run, I nearly went and bought a brand new BMW M5. It was about $260,000. And I was going to sell my Bitcoin to buy that landfill race car. And what do I mean by landfill? Eventually it's going to end up in landfill. But because I knew the money I was holding is constantly going up and to the right, it actually changed my behavior. It changed my behavior where I thought, you know what? I'm not giving up my Bitcoin. I've already got a nice six series. That's running pretty well. I'm not going to actually buy this new car because yes, it's a depreciating asset, but also with what I'm 
buying it with, that's an, an appreciating asset. So I don't want to get rid of that. So it actually changed my behavior. And you actually see a lot of crypto goers who are holding this asset. They consume less. They don't buy this landfill junk and crap that just ends up as hurting the environment. Whether you're shopping for Louis Vuitton man bag crap or expensive cars or the shoes of the week or going on holidays, it changes your behavior because you're now holding an asset that goes up in value over time. So ironically, sure, there are a lot of people who are millionaires and they go and buy a Lambo, but as an aggregate, the consumption goes down because when I have a money that goes up in value, I'm more inclined to hold it. Equally or conversely, if I've got a money that constantly goes down in value, the US dollar, I'm more inclined to spend it. Now we go on to the next part of where Bitcoin saves the environment and energy. Do you know how much energy it takes to run a war machine? Unforeseeable amounts of energy and fuel and bombs and steel and bodies and environmental damage to run the war machine. And as I mentioned earlier, if you have to go to war and you've got to take blocks of gold out of your vault to fund that war, you're probably less likely to go to war because wars cost money lots of money. In the olden days, sure, we went over and we conquered empires and we stole all their loot, the spoils of war. But war's a little bit different now. Now it's a tool to tell people to do what you want so you can print your own money. If you're not going to as many wars because you can't just print the money anymore, you're in fact saving the environment beyond comprehension. The amount of fuel that runs aircraft carriers and jets and tanks and ships and, air and <laughs> the whole arsenal of a military is huge, but it's not just the fuel, it's all of the mining and the construction and the people and the movement and the bombs and the bullets and the explosion and the smoke, all of that has a massive impact on the environment. Now, if that is all funded by a money that can just be printed out of thin air, it is more likely that you're going to use that tool at your disposal. But when it's linked to a hard money, whether it's gold or Bitcoin, the behavior changes and ironically, it saves the environment. Interesting. And uh, Adam, uh, sorry, Jason asked a question. Um, can Adam cite the source for that information about the dryers? I can. Yes, I can. Uh, I'd have to go through Twitter. I can find it, but I'd have to go through through my own Twitter files to do it. So yes, I can, but not in the next 30 seconds. But it's okay. a fair question. Yeah, yeah. I can't well, just pull it out of thin air. Maybe yeah. later, send me the link and I'll put it in the comments below. How about that? Now, we're coming up to the last um, um, sort of 20 minutes or so, and there's a couple of questions that I just wanted to explore as we, as we do this. The first is, we know that um, some countries have sort of adopted Bitcoin as an alternative. We also know that Argentina recently voted in a, a new president who said he would like to get rid of the central bank, and I think he's quite pro-Bitcoin as, well as, uh, as well as that. So... What's the story with regard to the um, adoption of Bitcoin within the countries around the world? Is it still running forward or uh, has it failed? Because, of course, the price at which uh, um, some of those countries entered the Bitcoin market is it's a lot lower now than where it was. Yes. So it's gaining more and more, more momentum because, as I said, globally, people don't like the, the deal of the US dollar. They don't. What, so there's two parts to it when it comes to the US dollar and government and people turning away from it. You've got what's the financial value of this money, but then what controls am I handing over when I use this money? So you can see that if you're invested in the US dollar in any way, you're constantly losing purchasing power. That, that, that is a fact. It is constantly being diluted. And no matter how you hold this US value, whether it's in trends, uh, sorry, treasuries or bonds or physical cash in itself or uh, digits in a bank account, its purchasing power is constantly going down. That's one component. But the second component is that it's been weaponized. So what we saw with, and, and money is supposed to be neutral, but what we saw and can see with the US dollar, it is not neutral. Now, that might be great if you're the US or you love the US, but it's not great if you're not the US or you don't love the US because you lose the neutrality of what a global reserve is supposed to be. For example, when we saw the war kick off in Russia and Ukraine, the United States put sanctions on Russia. Now, that might be good and it might be bad, but Russia was sanctioned by the states with the weaponization of the US dollar. They took funds out of Russian accounts. They blocked them and stopped them from the SWIFT network, 
which stopped trade of the the petrodollar and Russian commodities and stocks and bonds and assets and everything going through the global financial ecosystem. And as a result, the world, including people who weren't Russia, they said, oh, hang on a second. If we don't do what Big Brother America likes, they can cut us out of the financial system. So all of the money that we had invested in America, that's just gone because they come up and said, well, you're all oligarchs, so we're stealing your yachts, we're stealing your bank accounts, we're stealing everything off you because your government is bad. So we're, we're going to basically pillage all of you people and we're going to call you oligarchs and we're going to steal your money. Now, maybe they were oligarchs, maybe they weren't, but in any case, it doesn't matter. They, they stole their money. They took their money because they didn't like what their government was doing. Then they, they basically threw Russia out of the financial system and said, we, now, we don't like what you're doing, so you can't play here anymore. Now, again, maybe that was a good thing. Maybe it was a bad thing. It doesn't matter. What matters is that the world saw, hang on, the US dollar can be weaponized. We're losing value in anything that we've worked for. So we work hard. We produce real stuff. They print this fake money that constantly goes down in value. That's a bad deal. But then we play with that game. And then we do something that Big Brother America doesn't like. So they take all of our money or block us from the financial systems. That's a really bad deal. So no matter which way you look at the US dollar, you're like, that's a pretty bad deal. Now for today, sure, it's a pretty liquid asset and you can do stuff very quickly. But what about tomorrow? And the, the real job of governments is to plan for the future. The problem with governments, I would argue, in the West is they only have a three-year term. And that's not very forward-looking because it's three years. And the real job of governments, let's be honest, is, is to get voted back in. On paper, it's supposed to be look, to look after the country. But in reality, it's like, right, I've got three years to somehow pull off something so I can get voted back in, so I can maintain my position. If it was a 10-year outlook, the, their behavior would be very different. And it's like, okay, well, it's not just about getting voted in the next three to five years. And if you look at communist nations, you know, they're looking out to 20 years and 30 years. And as a result, they're like, right, where are we going to be in 20 years? Now, you cannot plan anything in 20 years if you're dealing with a money that is a constantly going down in value very quickly but b can be confiscated blocked stopped seized from you at any time so you have to actually say well what's the alternative now some have said well it's going to be gold some have said it's going to be bricks but i say it should be bitcoin and the reason why i say it should be bitcoin is because i don't trust you you don't trust me we don't trust them and they don't trust us so let's go for a trustless money which is completely neutral and borderless and open and censorship resistant to everyone. And the most neutral money that we have in the world is Bitcoin. It's more neutral than gold because we can see that gold has been confiscated physically, but they can't confiscate my Bitcoin physically. Even if governments came in here right now and said, give me, your gold, give me a Bitcoin. And I said, I'm not giving it to you. And they put a bullet in my head. They can't then go and take my Bitcoin because they can't get access to it. So that's where it takes it, t it takes us to a whole different level. Now, just also on the global financial stage, I'll also mention when we can see that they stopped Russia from being part of the petrodollar or the SWIFT network, the ruble actually went up in value mm. because big nations like India, as an example, which is part of the Commonwealth, they said, well, we're still going to buy Russian oil. We don't care. And Russia said, all right. We're going to sell you our oil and it's going to be at half price because we've got a massive supply of it now because we're not selling as much as we're used to. And India and China's like, cool, half price oil. What do you want to be paid in? And Russia's like, well, we can't take the US dollar anymore because we're not allowed to. <laughs> so pay, pay us in the RMB or pay us in gold or pay us in anything but the US dollar. Now, of course, what happened to the ruble is it went up in purchasing power. So the weaponization of the dollar is actually another lever that the United States has lost control of. It's lost control of having the global reserve currency because they can only print so much of it. But also now when, when they try and weaponize it and say, you're no longer part of the SWIFT network or the petrodollar, other countries go, all right, well, we're going to bypass this and we're going to use a different currency. So what's happening now in poorer nations that we can see with El Salvador as an example, which was using the US dollar. Mm. Imagine using someone else's currency, which by default we all are because it's a global reserve. But as a daily trader per se, or a daily utility, El Salvador was using the United States dollar. And can you imagine being a people or a government and not having any control of your own financial system? So the president of El Salvador made a very wise move and said, you know what? I'm not concerned about the price over the next two or three years. It's not about that. It's not about buying low and selling high. It's not about that. It's about the foundation of money. It's about the architecture of money. 
And these great leaders are actually saying, that money is broken, that money is corrupt, that money is unfair. I'm going for the complete opposite of that, a hard, sound, immutable, fair, open money. I'm going for Bitcoin. And El Salvador was the first domino. Now you've got Argentina. Then you've got BlackRock, which, and I mentioned BlackRock, it's not a nation, but its GDP is as big as a nation. And sure, they're there to make a dollar, but they can actually see, or a Bitcoin, they can actually see what many of us can't yet see. That is, the dollar is done and we're moving to a new money. And big companies as successful as BlackRock are positioning themselves because they want to make a profit. But countries who are hurting are positioning themselves because they need to survive and they need to look after their people. And they're not going to do it with the US dollar. They're going to do it with Bitcoin. Interesting. A um, couple of people uh, reacting quite strongly, positively and negatively. That is you always expect in this, on this side, Adam. You don't get a free ride, a free ride on my channel, as, as you know. know. But that's fine. Last question. Last question for tonight. Central bank digital currency. There are a number of pilots running around the world number of places, different types of pilots, but with the idea of digitizing the um, existing currency in, in some form. Now, a few people in the chat earlier on said, well, maybe the, the whole Bitcoin story and indeed the intervention from the SEC, et cetera, et cetera, really is paving the way for the central bank digital currency. And maybe it's the central bank digital currency that ultimately are actually um, going to, uh, you know, come in over the top of Bitcoin and blow up Bitcoin. Um, what's your what's your thought about that? Yeah, so there's a few parts to that. So there's, there's a a theory that Bitcoin was actually, in fact, introduced by the governments to prime us or to get us ready for a CBDC. I, I, I don't believe that theory because it, it's grown so organically and it's not the way governments would do this. It, what's happening, in fact, is Bitcoin is the antithesis or the solution to the broken financial system. But everything's going to digital, but they're now, in fact, utilizing the power of blockchain, which is, you know, because there is a separation between Bitcoin and blockchain. They're not intertwinable. They're, they're different things. It's like saying email is the internet. E email is not the internet. The internet is the internet and email is email, but they kind of sit on top of each other. So when it comes to Bitcoin and blockchain, Bitcoin is merely an application on top of the blockchain. When it comes to a CBDC, Governments absolutely want to leverage off the power of the blockchain, just as they wanted to leverage off the power of the internet. And that's perfectly fine. Governments want to leverage off the power of the printing press, the motor vehicle, the telephone and the internet and now blockchain. So it's quite natural that governments are going to use the internet of value, which is arguably crypto and the blockchain. When it comes to a CBDC though, a CBDC doesn't change the architecture for Bitcoin. Bitcoin will always be Bitcoin. They can't break the code. Bitcoin is what it is. That's not to say that they don't want to change their fiat and make it more controllable. And they will absolutely do this because they love their fiat because they can print it out of thin air and they can do what they want with it. But when it comes to taking fiat and merging it into a CBDC or morphing it into a CBDC, all a CBDC is, is fiat on steroids. Fiat is a broken, corrupt, unlimited money that empowers those at the top who can print it. And a CBDC is an extension of that. It's an extension of that because when it comes to a bail-in or bail-out law, instead of going to the banks and saying, we're going to bail in or bail out, they just go to everyone's digital wallets or digital accounts, if people aren't familiar with the terms. And overnight, you wake up in the morning and suddenly 30% of your wallet is missing. It's like, well, what happened? And well, that's what a CBDC is. They can just say, I'm just taking everyone's money. Equally, if they want to print more of a supply, they can just print it that way. When it came to how you spend your money, if there was another global pandemic and it had a CBDC and you lived in Queensland and you went over the border to New South Wales and you tried to buy milk, there could be a geographical boundary on your money that said, no, you can only spend this money in Queensland, not New South Wales or vice versa. So a CBDC is nothing more than a fiat on steroids. A CBDC is not Bitcoin. And even if these big players come in and say, right, we've got a CBDC, it goes back to, as I mentioned this, I think over a year to you on this channel, I said, if we're in the global village and I'm selling a crate of these water bottles and someone comes to me and says, hey, Adam, I want to buy a crate of your water bottles. And I say, okay, well, what are you, what's your offer? And they say, I'm going to give you 50 billion CBDCs. And I'm like, 50 billion CBDCs, well, what's that worth? Okay, what's well, worth a crate of water bottles, apparently. 
But then someone else comes to me and says, hey, Adam, I'm going to give you 50 BTC. I'll be like, well, hang on. I'll take the BTC because I know what the supply of BTC is, but I don't know what the supply of the CBDC is. And by the way, even if I do know the supply of the CBDC, they can print that money at any time. Or just as they've weaponized the US dollar through the SWIFT network, they can now weaponize the CBDCs on the global stage. So the, the question for all of us is, if you have a choice, and I, I know it leads to the question of, well, we won't get the choice. The, the US government or the Australian government will say, you can't use this Bitcoin. Well, how did that go for the US government saying you can't use money to Russia or to China? They can't control it. It's like saying you're not going to use this website. Well, I can just get a VPN and, and, and use the website. You cannot stop Bitcoin. And the free market will decide. The truth is in the markets. And the truth is Bitcoin is way more valuable than a CBDC. That doesn't mean there won't be a CBDC. There will absolutely be a CBDC. We can't stop it. We cannot stop it. But equally, you cannot stop Bitcoin. Absolutely. Very interesting com comments and uh, again in the chat. But uh, this one from Jason was, I thought, particularly interesting. We might finish off with, with this. Um, and thank you for the uh, super chat, Jason. Always appreciated. Um, his question was, what happens if somebody is able to corrupt the Bitcoin distributed ledger, um, you know, or some sort of ransomware or something? In other words, how immutable, how immutable is the, um, the technology that underpins Bitcoin? Okay, well, ultimately, if it's corrupted, it's, it's broken. Uh, mm. Same as if, fee, uh, if the gold standard was corrupted, it broke. And that's exactly what we can see now. The gold standard was corrupted with fiat, and then that broke the gold standard. Equally, if fiat, uh, sorry, if Bitcoin is corrupted, it is broken. There's, there's no disguising that. But the reason why Bitcoin is so different is because it, it doesn't sit in one central body. And even if I go on there now and I say, right, I'm doing a double spend on this Bitcoin. So I get 51% of the mining power and I spend millions of dollars in miners and probably millions of dollars in energy. And I'm able to double spend one Bitcoin. So I've just spent $50 million to create a $30,000 Bitcoin. The rest of the network, which is anywhere and everywhere says, that's a dodgy transaction. We're not accepting that. They fork off itself and they create a new chain. It's a lot of technology behind it, but ultimately for 14 years, not 140 years, 14 years, this thing has been running and people have been trying to break it and they haven't broken it. So I can't guarantee that this will work, but I can guarantee that fiat won't. So ultimately, it's the best solution we have at the moment. And after 14 years of the greatest minds and nations and companies and hackers and countries trying to break it, Bitcoin doesn't get weaker, it gets stronger. Right. Well, Adam, we've come to the end of the show. Thank you very much, as always, for sharing your thoughts and opinions. And as always, of course, you stir, on a, stir up a whirlwind in the chat, but that's absolutely, absolutely fine. I mean, there are clearly believers and there are people who actually, um, you know, are on the other side of the equation. And, and I come back and sort of my closing thought, and I'll let you have a closing thought, that there is still a bit of religious fervor in all of this, it seems to me, because mm. not everything is, you know, transparent and clear and there are still lots of questions and i do believe that there is actually an extent there is a extent of needing to believe or not wanting to believe as part of this story and to that extent the question is genuinely open but i come back to my point the current financial system is pretty broken so if there is a better alternative out there i'd love to see it i'm with you entirely the financial system is broken and I believe we have found a solution. But if the viewers out there believe that they have found a better solution, I'm all in. But what you'll never convince me of, Martin or viewers, is that the current financial system works and is fair and is safe and is sound. The current financial system is completely broken, cor completely corrupt, not fair, not sound, and is going to lead to a lot of people to complete impoverishment and a massive wealth gap for all of us. So why I'm here is not to shill a coin to say, this is a cool thing that you can buy low and sell high. That's just a consequence. That's a consequence of getting into a technology early that goes up in value because it has such utility. Ultimately, I'm here to look for a better solution. And if anyone can present a better solution than Bitcoin, I'm all in. But to date, I've been screaming this cry for over six, seven years now and all the best I've ever got is 
I don't like that Bitcoin's a scam. And I said, well, that's not a solution. First of all, you haven't proven anything. And second of all, you haven't given me a solution. We need to all come together. And when it comes to money, I find there's a lot of emotion around money. And when I come to Bitcoin, you know, I, I've been doing this stuff for, for, as I said, over seven years. And what I can see is that when it comes to money, there's a lot of emotion around money. And part of the emotion is we've been lied to. We've been lied to twice. One, we've been lied to to say, fiat or the dollar is linked to gold. It's not linked to gold, it's linked to nothing. And two, we've been lied to to say Bitcoin's a scam. It's not a scam, it's the fairest money in the history of humanity. So we've got this emotion that is stirred up amongst all of us because some believe a lie. And the lies that we've been told from both sides is Bitcoin bad, fiat good. And they are both lies. Bitcoin is not bad and fiat is not good. Bitcoin is good and fiat is bad. Probably oversimplified, but ultimately <laughs> we're all in this together. I've got nothing to sell you. I'm not shilling anything. And Bitcoin out of the 26,000 coins out there, most of them are going to zero. I'm the first to tell you that. But there will be one global reserve. And whatever that global reserve is, it should be fair, neutral, open and transparent. Thank you, Adam. And as always, um, if people would like to know more about what you do and, um, you know, the information, because you've been pumping out a lot of information through a lot of places. Where's the best place for them to follow you? Come join me over at the Adam Stokes crypto channel. That's over, over at YouTube. Just put in Adam Stokes. Join the community. We have a strong community. We have people from intermediate and advanced uh, crypto goers and economists. I, I have an economics background. Read my book, 28 Pro Trader Tips, The Art of Trading. That's on the different side outside of Bitcoin. That's trading and understanding the art of trading if you want to get into that space. Equally, if you want to do anything crypto safely, head over to the crypto.land. That's www.thecrypto.land, where everything that I find safe in this space to protect you from scams is on that one simple and secure site. Finally, you can follow me on Twitter at Adam underscore Stokesy. And if you do have a better solution to Fiat and Bitcoin, I will bring you on the channel and we'll have a discussion. And I'm, I'm keen to learn from you. Adam, thank you very much. And uh, just to underscore, you know, these conversations are designed to help people think and play around with the ideas and, and, and explore them, you know, not advocating always a solution, but it's, it's, it's the conversation and the discussion, which I really value. And uh, Adam, thank you very much for your time. Once again, I look forward to doing it um, down the track as we see how these uh, crazy times develop and uh, I'll take you offline now. And uh, to close the show. Thank you very much for your time tonight. Really appreciate it.